So, welcome Daniel Bartsch, uh, co-founder and CEO of Credit Chef. Uh, Credit Chef, uh, you, you found the company five years ago, if I'm correct, right? Um, almost seven years ago. Ah, seven years life. ago. Seven I'm years fine. ago. Very good. But it's already listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. Yes, that's correct. Um, we have, uh, I think, in a very early stage in the life of our company, we have decided to go public. And um, in 2018, we floated the company as part of an IPO in uh, Frankfurt. And ever since we are listed in the prime standard of Frankfurt Stock Exchange. And uh, yeah, so uh, that was a good one. Well, congrats. Uh, that's, that's super fast. What's your market cap right now? Do you know that? Roughly? Yeah, obviously, um, the share is relatively thinly traded. Um, we are we are sort of tr typically trading between 60 and 70 million euro market cap at the moment. And okay, I expect right. um, I expect and uh, very optimistic um, to, to see that grow, um, clearly because our business is growing and um, market cap should be a, a, a reflection of this in the long run. You know, the, the great uh, part of this now is that uh, you're one of the rare occasions where we could invest. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Also the... <laughs> People are always complaining that they, they don't get access to um, relatively early stage opportunities um, because these are typically, you know, private and, um, and not accessible. I think that was also one of the reasons why we said we, we go public is, um, is to say not only, I think, for the money, we, I think, could have organized the money in, uh, through private channels as well. But I think the predominant um, consideration for us was that by the move into the prime standard, we get this, um, I would say, approval, stamp of approval in terms of um, transparency, because we have to report on a quarterly basis, which is very important if you operate a business like ourselves, where you interface a lot with, you know, institutional investors who put a lot of focus on reputation, on transparency, on professional standards, um, that you basically have this in place. And this was one of the key considerations. And of course, from an investor perspective, um, I would say the, the, the beauty uh, is that it's a company which early stage is the first sort of pure play fintech um, in Germany that has IPO'd. And um, yes, it gives you an opportunity um, to, to invest um, with, with smaller money, yeah. That's amazing. And I mean, great for everybody, yeah? great for any shareholder, be it investors or like uh, co-founders or maybe employees who have some shares. So that's really cool. Congrats already for that one. Um, mm -hmm. And before we, before we deep dive into, into our sales and marketing topics, uh, I would like to get to know, or we all would like to uh, know a little bit more about yourself. So let's start with where are you living? I'm actually living in Freiburg, um, south of Germany, um, which is where I was born. Um, I, I must admit, though, that I haven't spent my whole life here. Um, we basically, after, after um, graduating from high school, I went on to, to Mannheim to get uh, my, my studies. Um, and after that, um, you know, had a stint of um, I would say arrangements and uh, appointments um, that took me both nationally but also internationally. Um, I was working for many years outside Germany in Switzerland and later in, in Asia and in Singapore. And when we when we founded Credit Shelf and, and basically decided to move back to Germany, uh, we founded Credit Shelf and it's still based today in Frankfurt. But I thought to myself, you know, after coming back for, after many years um, coming back to Germany. I thought to myself, Freiburg would be the place. And um, that means I'm being based again in my hometown. And I, it means I have to travel a lot. Um, I usually take the train, which is good. So there's an ICE fast train connection to, to Frankfurt, um, which brings me there. You can work uh, in the train. I think everybody has realized probably during the pandemic that uh, new working arrangements are uh, ever more popular. Um, I've been actually practicing already for a, a number of years before, uh, home office slash train, train office, however you want to call it. So I'm pretty used and pretty flexible to that. Yeah, that's really, I, I mean, two topics that I like, like here and that I, I see some patterns now also in my life. Uh, so the first one is, um, I'm originally from, from South Germany, uh, the Allgäu, so close to the Alps. And most of my friends um, 
as I went abroad or did some like ventures outside of our home region, but almost everybody came home at some point um, because it's just, you know, you have your home support system and friends and somehow it's, it's nice to get home. So I like, I like that you, you also uh, went into the same direction. Um, and that's also my goal to come, come back home, so to say, um, because of all the benefits there. And the second one is like the work from anywhere now. And I think, uh, and that's not the main topic of our um, call now, but I think that um, there are companies that are able to learn how to work efficiently in a remote setting have a competitive advantage in the future. And there are some companies like, I don't know if you know it, Automatic is one company uh, founded by Matt Mulbeck. It's a company with, what's it, what's it again? Uh, but he, he basically created WordPress and created a company on top of WordPress. And it, it was like worth 3 billion in 2018. And it's, uh, it's remote. So it is possible, but you have to change culture and a lot of other things to make it happen. Yeah. Yes, absolutely agree. And I think the, uh, the current pandemic situation, probably the one positive from it is that, um, you know, if and when hopefully it goes away soon, but uh, you will have a lot of lessons learned coming from it. And uh, one of this is clearly the fact that uh, I think everybody has seen that working from anywhere um, is actually possible. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what do you love to do outside of work? I mean, for everybody who's not from Germany uh, listening to us, uh, Freiburg is like the sunniest region, I think, in Germany. So you mostly have sunny and nice warm weather. So what do you do? That's correct, which is also one of the reasons to decide to go and come back here. Um, and in fact, as you correctly said, um, I'm trying to spend a, a lot of time outside. Um, I'm actually a sport enthusiast. Um, I try and go running, I try and go cycling, uh, mountain biking, race biking, um, you know, whatever, whenever I can spend some time, it even means in the summer before work, I try and go swimming, you know, all this kind of stuff um, usually is possible quite, quite nicely here. So I'm spending a lot of time there and um, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying uh, that. And I'm also try if I get a moment to read uh, both you know, business, uh, but also non-business. Um, and um, yeah, that's pretty much, you know, what I do. That's almost a triathlon, I would say, swimming, biking, running, I mean. <laughs> yeah, I should consider that at one point. I think there's always this idea of, I first need to get better with regard to shape, but um, I think, yeah, predominantly given that usually I would spend um, 20 hours a week in the train in the pre-COVID, uh, which hasn't happened now since quite some time. I had the, the pleasure to be able to put more hours into training. So maybe I, uh, I, I should think about that at one point. Yeah, and I mean, you don't have to do an Ironman. I'm a triathlete, I am middle distance. So, uh, but I also worked myself up from short distance to Olympic to middle distance. So um, even a short distance, everybody can do it and almost everybody can finish. So, and it's, you have to do it and then either you love it or you hate it. Yeah, yeah I think it's sometimes during the, uh, during the competition, there's this moment of hating it. I remember when I was uh, <laughs> doing um, in my uh, high school exams, I, I had to do the, the 1000 meter and um, well, that's tough. I think it, I ended in 240. Um, I, I, I hated it. I said to myself afterwards, never do it again. But I think this moment just only lasts for a couple of weeks and then you get back into the, the bite, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's what most triathletes, especially the ones, the crazy ones who do Ironman, say like mostly directly after they say never again. And like a few hours later or even days later, they say, wow, I have to do it again. Yes. It's always the same. Yeah. Um, tell me about your company, Credit Shelf. What are you doing? Yeah, so Credit Shelf is a direct lending platform. We originate and we lend uh, to uh, basically German SMEs. So we facilitate loans, we give them capital. Um, to support their business. Um, basically, we are filling the void that banks are leaving. Uh, you know, even though there's thousands of banks uh, in the German market, um, they are typically going after the same kind of business, which is relatively low risk, uh, fully secured um, financing situations. And I think what we are attracting and, and servicing is to sort of space where banks are less involved. It's not to say that our clients don't get access to banks. Typically our clients are bankable and they get access to bank funding, but the banks will 
you know, take a careful stance and not necessarily provide them with all the funding that the business would like to get in place. And this is where we come in place. So we basically support and lend to two distinct types of companies. One is the traditional SME German Mittelstand, of which we have thousands, which is a good thing. We have tens of thousands of Mittelstands company in Germany. Um, small businesses to medium-sized businesses, typically family-owned businesses um, that are sitting in the regions, that have been in the regions for many, many years because they're family businesses run. It means they sometimes have more than 100 years of history. And uh, they basically get in touch with us when they need quick response and access to finance that they cannot quickly secure via their banks. And the other segment is... Um, is growth companies, uh, young, um, fast growing, uh, how we call them scale up companies um, that need obviously in order for them to facilitate their growth that need access to capital. And uh, we are basically also serving them uh, via loans. And uh, these are typically, as I've said, is sort of the future of, of the German economy, because often what we what we support here are digital based businesses um, that are typically asset light and hence not you know liked too much by by banks because there's not so much physical assets that banks can can lend against and on the flip side and most of the they time they don't not, understand the business too yeah they don't understand the business necessarily and uh, they're also in in many cases because they're still young and growing fast not already profitable they're on the path to profitability but they're not strictly yet profitable and therefore this is also a situation that is not so easy for banks and here again we step into the void we try and fill the void um, and help those businesses to get to the next level and um, and try to make an impact you know for our economy and for the future of our economy because this will be the future um, we will have much more businesses like this and the pandemic has only acted as a catal catalyst um, here Yeah. So just to understand better your, your two customer groups, uh, what kind of revenue does a, a scale up have to have to be considered for you? Is, is, or how do you like what kind of um, measures do you take to say, okay, this is a company that I would consider? Maybe it's not revenue. I don't know. Yeah, no, we are, of course, we are delivering a service. As I've said earlier, we're a direct lending platform. That mm. means we don't lend our own money. Um, we are on one side, as I've explained, addressing borrowers who are in Germany, companies who are in Germany who need loans. And on the other side, we have a network of institutional investors um, who are long capital and who need access to lending opportunities. And we do this with our platform. So we have two groups of customers, if you want, and we provide a service to both. As a result, our um, revenue model is, um, is designed in a way that we are being paid by both parties. That means the borrower, when they get a loan through our platform, they pay a one-off fee, um, which is part of the loan. Um, so it's typically a small percentage um, of the notional amount of the loan. And on the other side, the investor, because they get access to the opportunity to invest um, into you know, credit analyzed, risk vetted, risk vetted loan opportunities um, done by us, they basically pay an investor fee. And the investor fee also comprises our service that we service the loan over the lifetime. That means obviously we're managing the repayments. Uh, so the investor basically gets the fully fledged package. They, they, they get access and they also get the servicing. Mm -hmm. Understood. So if I am a, a scale up, uh, at what point would you say, does it make sense to apply for a loan and try to get access to someone who gives me money? Yeah, so what we do, um, and I think this is correctly, this sort of difference between, I would say semantically between a startup and a scale up. So the startups is something where we think from our perspective, this is typically still an equity situation. That means you don't have proof of um, concept. 
you are still very, very early stage. You're being, you're setting up the company. You're sort of trying to get firsthand feedback from the market, whether your product works, whether there's a fit with the solution that you're actually, you know, offering and proposing to the market. This is equity stage. I think from our perspective, it's about this sort of next level where when you get from this exploring into the actually scaling. So it means you have product market fit. Um, now you go into the next level, which is you want to accelerate and grow your business. And you've proven that you have um, a product market fit. Typically, this means you have at least three years. So from a formal uh, perspective, you have at least three years of, um, of company history. Um, and, um, and you have shown already with your revenues that, that they are growing and growing quite significantly. We want to see at least 1 million euro uh, of revenues. Um, and for those companies that are still that young, we want to clearly obviously see um, a growth trajectory um, demonstrated in the past, but also obviously we look at the plan and the future. And we also put a lot of focus on, okay, how are you backed? So who's behind you? Um, what's the, the equity cap table? Um, who are the investors behind you? You know, are they supportive of your business? Um, can, they, can they support you? Are they willing uh, to support you? Um, to where you need to get to, which is the next level. And I think if we get comfortable with both, I mean, on one side, you see, or oh, we look at the, so what has been achieved already in the past. We then look at the plan for the future. We test the business model and the assumptions. And then we see a good combination or a good shareholder behind. Um, this, I think, is the in ingredients that we like. And in those sort of situations, we are very accessible and we can throw a few millions into your business. That's amazing. Um, and a good alternative to giving away shares. Yeah. Uh, so yes, it's a good, it's always, basically a competition to VCs. Yeah. Exactly. You always have this topic, right? You have the, the, you have the question for you and this stage is, okay, I do an equity raise now you dilute, um, but maybe in six or 12 months time, uh, you have achieved much more already in terms of milestones. Um, you have bridged this with uh, debt instead of having to take the equity early. You take it later. You take it at a different valuation. Uh, so I think this um, this can make a lot of sense. Yes. Yeah. And for the SMEs, is there like because we have uh, some some company owners listening to us? Is there like a, a revenue cap? We say minimum one, two, five, ten million. After that, it would make sense to talk to us. As I've said, one million, revenue, euro, yeah. one, one million million. euro is the minimum that we okay. that we like to see. Um, uh, as I've said, we have a number of distinct institutional investors behind us. Mm -hmm. Some of them require more. Uh, so we have, of course, different funding pots, but we organize all of this. This is more or less okay. in transparent to the to the SME and the borrower coming to us where the capital comes from. But for us, clearly, one million is the absolute minimum. Uh, two and a half million is a sort of next step, which gives with our funding gives again a little bit more um, opportunity um, and then there's no limit upwards uh, of course um, but i think what we tend to see is that those companies that are in the hundreds of millions of revenues they tend to have other alternatives they don't necessarily have to come to credit shelf either because they have other alternatives or they are already too big bear in mind the loan sizes we provide are starting from hundred thousand euro they go up to five million and uh, of course, the fit here with this product is geared more towards company, I would say, in the 1 million to 100 million-ish sort of space. Mm -hmm. um, so that everyone, which is not already at, uh, at capital markets, um, um, a capital market-oriented company. Cool. Can you give us some indication of the size of your company? Yes, so um, Credit Shelf is based in Frankfurt. Uh, we are roughly 75 people. Um, in the meantime, we have, in addition, we have small offices in Munich um, as well as Berlin um, at this point, but most of the team are, are being based in Frankfurt. And, um, and I should say in terms of the size of the business, we have, um, last year we have uh, facilitated loan requests um, coming into our platform uh, in excess of uh, significantly in excess of 1 billion euros worth. Uh, we have uh, in the meantime, I would say lent uh, significantly in excess of 300 million euros, uh, more than 100 million over the past 12 months. 
so the business is growing quite quite significantly for us. Mm -hmm. We see this demand. We see particularly this demand from the companies that are now um, looking for growth finance that are falling outside. Um, I would say the the, the sort of uh, grids of traditional banks, including the KFW support schemes that we've seen as a result of mm -hmm. Corona, uh, they are all not geared towards the young, fast-growing companies. They still seem to fall through, I would say, the grid, and this is where mm -hmm. we see a lot of need. Mm -hmm. um, in our pre-interview, we talked a little bit about the two different mindsets of um, basically German company owners and Anglo-Saxon company owners. Um, when it comes to growing a company, um, in, in your point of view, what, what's the biggest difference there? I think it's, a, it's, it's some sort of mindset difference, clearly, that you can identify here. And uh, even though um, you could say it's, it's, it's maybe, um, yeah, it's maybe a little bit over accentuated, but I think the way I look at this is that tendency wise, the American sort of um, owner uh, and also investor are more aggressive over the European and particularly the German ones. I think we in Germany, you know, we are the land of the, the thinkers and, uh, and also the, the technicians. I think we are very good in what we do. Sometimes we probably, you know, we should be more vocal about it. Um, and um, I think this is where, where I'm seeing the biggest difference in terms of willingness, uh, aggressiveness to, um, you know, to attack and, um, and not stay behind and, and basically show out and, um, and get to the next level quickly. Um, I think the hardest, I, I get what you're saying, and I, I find myself also in this trip with our little company that you say, okay, at what stage do you want to be more aggressive? Is it too early or um, is it the right point? Because uh, to, being too fast can be bad and being too slow can also be bad. Um, do you have a take on when it's time to basically um, start the rocket and, and, and pour in a lot of money equaling fuel to, to grow faster? Mm -hmm. I think the rocket is a, good, um, is a good picture here that you're using. And I think we've also, in our own world, and when we started Credit Charles, sometimes we've, we referred to this picture of the rocket. And we said, at some point, the rocket, for it to launch, it needs to get this excess velocity, right? That means it has to lift off of the ground. And then when it has lifted off, you even have to accelerate because there's still this risk when it goes up that it stalls and then, you know, goes down again. And I think this is something that you should keep in mind. I know we have this tendency of, you know, wanting to make things, you know, safe and, 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 and sometimes maybe a little bit too perfect. Um, I agree, uh, and particularly if I look at our business, financial services is not a business where you should not, by any means, do unforced errors, right? You notice the tennis player, you know, the, I mean, unforced errors is part of the tennis game. I think it's part of life. Uh, but in financial services, it can be deadly. Um, and therefore, I think even in a model like ourselves, you need to look, do a lot of pre-work the foundation and the model and the processes, they need to be set in, in place such a way that they work. Because if you run into an unforced error, particularly in an early stage of the life of a company, this can be the immediate end. Um, you know, you have regulators around, even though for fintechs, the regulatory um, space is a little different to banks, but still you have regulators out there. In addition, you have customers, institutions, they all have very high expectations. And either you have a solution that works or it doesn't. However, having said that, once you put this in place, and in terms of credit shelf, it took us a year. Um, we spent a full year just ironing out, you know, the legal setup, uh, the way, you know, we have the money transfer from the investor to the borrower ultimately. In the meantime, or in the middle, setting a bank that facilitates the, the process from a, from a regulatory perspective, all the agreements that go along with it. And of course, not to, not to forget the front end, which is the customer facing platform, lots of things to look at. Uh, so we had a lot do a lot of work and we couldn't go live. Uh, you know, it took us more than a year before we could actually launch it. But I think at some point, and this is why I'm coming back to that, 
at some point you need to accelerate and it is even before you know whether things work or not so you can't at least that's my belief of course you know there are maybe a few examples differently to that but doing this strictly you know by bootstrapping i think you lose opportunity and sometimes you also lose time and not to say that bootstrapping is, is a bad idea but at some point you need to you need to think ahead a little and you need to go in earlier than than actually the business is already prepared because you just need to lay the foundations and you need to be, to be a little bit ahead of the curve and i think that's what i would say probably an american in our position they would we have raised roughly 20 millions with our IPO. The American guys would have probably gone there and say, look, 20 million is, is, is peanuts. Uh, we do 200 million. And probably the Americans in the Silicon Valley, if our business was being set up in the Silicon Valley, the, the, the investors would have said, yes, 200 millions, of course, you know, let's put it on there. Uh, we are not that developed yet, uh, unfortunately, I should say. Um, that's also a difference. But still, I mean, in the sort of boundaries that we operate within these boundaries, still, I think that I think you can't wait too long. And I think for me, that if you if you ask me, should I go, should I wait a little longer or should I accelerate a little earlier? I would tendency wise, if you ask yourself the question, it, it implies you're not quite sure. You think there could be reasons for both. I would tend to say if you think there's reasons for both, it would be the accelerate option. That is super interesting because I find myself in this situation now <laughs> with our company and it's exactly what you said. You, you think, okay, maybe let's hit these two more milestones. Let's do these things in our processes so that we are sure that we can accelerate um, because you also don't want to like build something up and then uh, break it just because you were too fast. But I also get your notion of well, uh, sometimes success comes with acceleration um, and it's it's a really hard, like, uh, I think there's no super right or wrong way, but I get what you're saying. Um, you you really have at least to consider um, also the, the the rocket stage, so to say, and maybe, um, maybe, maybe start a little bit earlier than you might think. Yeah. Um, coming back to Credit Chef, um, I mean, you, you're quite successful in, in winning clients on both sides. I mean, basically you're a two-sided marketplace, so to say, uh, but looking at this side of uh, winning SMEs and fast growing companies as, as clients, um, which is and, and basically entering a totally new market. What are the key learnings um, of your last couple of years when it came to um, growing your company, especially uh, with focus on sales and marketing? Yeah. Um, I, I, and I'm, I must really say it's a continuous process. You never stop learning. And that's why it's so important to dive ever deeper into the matter and, you know, try and find out even more on a, on a granular level, you know, what can we do better next time? You know, what's the data telling us? Um, and as you correctly said, there's also two different types of customers um, and they are not using the same typically channels. So you can't reach a traditional old school family offices, family office that sits, you know, in Oberstaufen, where nearby you come from in Allgäu. Uh, and they, you don't reach the managing director uh, of this company, who's probably also the owner. You don't reach him via the same channel than, let's say, um, a digital um, insurance company uh, that needs working capital or, or growth capital um, to come to the next round because it's two, two, two relatively different types of animals. And um, I think what we have put a lot of focus on, so first of all, we started in the traditional SME space. Uh, we didn't initially have the focus on the fast growing um, scale up companies. Um, and when we were on the SME side, it was also, I think, great for us because we knew those guys are so conservative and you basically need to convince them with a solution, you know, that's up to the expectation of someone who's very old school, bank oriented, has been banking with, you know, with the, with the local bank, the local Sparkas, the local Volksbank for more than 50 years or two or three generations. So you have to basically come with a product that matches the expectations of such a conservative clientele. Um, so that's already one thing. But I think now in terms of the channels, you know, we've tried um, 
many different things, um, but came to the conclusion that you need to adapt, of course, to your to your audience. So, in other words, we we at, at the end, even though we're a digital business, we found out that uh, you know traditional offline campaigns are relatively important, you know, to get in contact with the with the old school customers. And it was so funny, and I'm telling an anecdote here. So in other words, we were sending out, you know, snail mail, right? So post post letters. And with the post letter, what we did is, um, you know, of course, we presented who we are, what we can do, how we can help. And, um, and, and the first one we were we were saying, Come to our web page, uh, you know, and uh, and register online, and we can help you. And conversion was was not so great. Okay, it was it was it wasn't a disaster, but it was it was not so great. And um, some time later, we then came with the next idea to say, let's give them a fax response, right? So. <laughs> Basically, no. we sent a letter. <laughs> and on this side, you know, there's just this other page where you, you fill in your name. You say, "Please call me at this point in the day," or "I'm interested in getting your brochure," or your, you know, whatever it is. So you give them a call to action, which is you can also send this to fax if you like to us. Of course, we then have a system that converts it directly into PDF, email, and you know, we have somebody that looks at it. But this, however, interestingly, you know, converted much better than, than trying to bring them into the online channel, right? So that was lots of interesting learnings. This is, of course, the top of the iceberg thing. But then, ideally, at some point, obviously, you start to segment your clients, right? And you find out that within your client segmentation, it makes a tremendous difference, you know, what kind of industry are you talking about? What kind of age? Are you talking about? Are you really addressing the, um, let's say, the senior um, uh, managing director who has been the business owner for 25 uh, years and who is in his 60s and almost like um, at the end of or close to retirement? Or is there maybe also another second managing director, maybe the next generation who's in the mid 30s, who is much more online, potentially much more online oriented? And those sort of findings, you know, when you have the top of the iceberg, you don't see nothing. And when you do these little tests, uh, you always have to be very clear about what you want to learn. And, um, and, and then you can sort of deep dive into various segments and try again, and you will find much other results. Yeah. And what you're saying, I, I can just like, I see it in our, our business, we help, um, we help, mainly consultancies, but also B2B companies to grow faster. And um, they struggle a lot in the beginning with um, identifying the ideal customer and then segmenting, like you said, segmenting this ideal customer into subgroups that have something in common so that you can provide value to each group that, that makes sense to this group. As you said, like even within one group, maybe you talk to the CEO or you talk maybe to the CFO or you talk to second level management and each one has a different mindset, different problems, and you have to come with different content and solutions in order to convince them. And um, many businesses that we see, they they are more farming businesses. So they, um, yeah, they grew with reputation and with word of mouth. And it is a change of mindset that you, it sounds so simple in theory and you learn it in, in university, but if you have to do it in practice, it's really interesting to, uh, well, who's my ideal customer? Okay. Those is uh, those are the, the typically, this is my whole potential market and then okay where do I start and how do I segment this market that's uh, that's really really interesting how uh, like can you maybe if possible uh, if it's possible tell us the journey from where you started out and and how you then started to segment those uh, this this one big blob this one big group into sub segments and and what kind of tests you did to find it out. Yes, um, and um, as I've said, uh, we basically, uh, you know, in the early days, we started with buying lists, right? There is, uh, there is agencies who offer lists. Uh, some of them have better quality than others, uh, which is also learning uh, that, that we had to find out. 
and uh, and then you qualify these lists. You try to exactly do what I said earlier, segment them. You try, you run, You first of all, you run a test or say you run a campaign um, unsegmented uh, and you tr sort of see what happens. And then you build hypothesis and you try to segment and you run the same thing. Um, ideally under equal circumstances and you you sort of try to find out okay what well, what does the numbers and the findings tell us and and we did a lot of this in the particularly with regard to the marketing um through direct campaigning um performance campaign that was really a lot uh, which, which we have done here at the same time we've with we, i mean we're a digital company but we we realized as a result of the whole process we realized it's quite important to basically give our customers the feeling that they know there's somebody to, that they can speak to, that they know there's people that they can interface with. So we decided um, uh, also to go out um, a lot. I'm not saying that we called or say that we rang the bells with, with the customers, but we, for example, we introduced a format um, quite, quite a number of years ago, which has established itself quite nicely, which was the, called the business breakfasts. So we toured across Germany um, uh, you, we would usually have um, the, the biggest uh, six cities in Germany. We would have um, been in every one of them, at least on a quarterly basis, organizing a breakfast session, bringing speakers um, from the industry or other topics, um, bringing a nice format, um, as I've said, with a breakfast. Um, and here you would usually not expect uh, the SME uh, traditional companies, but who we could attract here, and that was the intention, was um, their, their, their auditors, their um, consultants, um, their tax advisors, um, you know, the intermediaries, okay? Interesting. Yeah. Those you could explain your story and they would understand it because they're professionals they're much more used to the language of a, let's say a finance professional talking to an sme sometimes is two different worlds um, you have to be very adaptive to anyway to your language when you speak directly with the customers and particularly if it's a business owner a family run it's a totally different thing to an employed cfo for example employed fully uh, educated cfo of course they speak the same language but Typically, these traditional family owners, they are so enthusiastic about their product and about their you know, solution and how they help and how they've built it. They can talk for ages, which is great. But at some point, of course, when you look at it from a credit perspective, you must come down and nail it, right? And come to the point of looking at it from a quantitative perspective. Of course, qualitative is important. And so there's two different worlds. Anyway, what I was trying to say is that we used uh, the intermediaries a lot mm -hmm. you know, for our sales process. Um, how, how, can, I, can I ask one question yeah. here? How did you find out that, because I assume in the beginning you didn't tackle intermediaries, but at some point you, you, you went for them. How, how come? Like, how, how did you start to tackle those? We, interestingly, it was part of our initial business case and hypothesis. Ah, okay. hypothesis. We thought it would be much more difficult to attract clients directly um, um, rather than um, through people who understand the market and uh, who have a network of client behind them who know. So typically each tax advisor, they have access to 50 or 100 SMEs. Okay. And they will know much better. They know, first of all, they know their clients and they also know the situation their clients are in. And they know who potentially is responsive uh, to such a solution. So mm -hmm. in other words, you explain one tax advisor, okay, how does your program work? In which situations can we help? What's the situation where we cannot help? But where, what's the situation where we can help? They have learned a little about it. They have memorized it. And then the situation occurs within their client base. And they'll think about, okay, well, I spoke to this guy. There was this breakfast in Hamburg a few months back maybe they can help and then they try to connect you know the dots mm -hmm. and, and this is basically how how we build up our um, our sales process uh, intermediary wise and then on the campaigning we did we did the same thing we did the campaigning directed towards the intermediaries um, but we also did it direct so um, we, we did both things in parallel of course the intermediaries 
uh, the interesting thing is that the intermediaries, I mean, they are very, they have a professional interest in understanding, in, 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 in making sure they understand what the market has to offer. They're always open to understand, okay, okay, you guys do this kind of thing. Okay, so you help where banks can't. Okay, this is helpful for me. I understand roughly how it works. We help where banks can't. And if they come across the situation, they will come back to you. The other thing is if you, if you address um, a client directly, it's, you can't go as deep typically. Uh, it's, it's like you either have to match now or you don't. And if, it, if there's no match, they'll not necessarily memorize so much. And um, you have to go again, I think. And this is how you, have, you, you always have to, in marketing, you always have to be um, redundant. I say, um, you know, coming out, it, it, it's something I, I, I didn't, I didn't dare to do really. I thought to myself, okay, so if you approach one client one time with your message and they say, and they don't respond, then it's a no forever, but this is not the case. <laughs> In order for you to place your message, you have to basically approach the one and the same client, you know, 20 times, 30 times. Maybe right? never ending, you know, and even through different channels. That's, yeah. the, that's, the, that's so important not just go one channel if they if they have learned from you in frankfurt allgemeine or handelsblatt okay they read this article there was this name and then okay next time they see an advert uh, you know online or whatever in, in linkedin or whatever it is then they see you in deutsche bahn because we put our client magazine there um, and then all of a sudden you know the, the tax advisor says hey i've spoken to those guys they, they're good they, then this at some point creates the fit I love many things that you said right now. Um, so, so one thing, and I, I can just say I, I'm with you on on the personal meetings. Um, unfortunately, it's right right now. It's pretty hard um, with Corona, but once it's over, that is super powerful, and it's not expensive. We did it also for for our clients and ourselves. And uh, I mean, what we did is, for example, in Munich, we rented out a small um, grocery store, like uh, not a like how to say a specialized grocery store with really good food and he um he provided some snacks and free wine and that was all you need you know and then you have a short introductory um, um talk by someone who adds value and then those people mingle and and you're the facilitator so that works wonders and everybody should have that in his pocket uh, that wants to attract b2b clients the next one is uh, what you what you said it just reminded me of the current situation we are all in. What you said about the tax advisors and they know their clients and who needs that help. It's exactly the same with our doctors right now that are able to start vaccination in Germany at least, uh, and they can choose freely who, whom to vaccinate. It's the same. You know, you know your patient so to say, and you can choose which one uh, is right for this medicine, which is helping. And in, in this case, I mean. Your case, uh, your medicine is helping someone who needs um, fin financial help in order to grow faster. Uh, so that is that is really clever and interesting. And the last one, which I like a lot, is you said multi multi channel because not everybody is recipient to to the same channel and um, hitting people more than once. And that's a mindset that I had in the beginning. I think most Germans somehow have two, maybe not the Americans. That, that you are allowed to remind people, you know, um, and if you do it in the right way and not spamming them and just saying, hey, buy this, buy this, buy this, but think about how you can add value uh, in this conversation, um, then it's totally different. Then they kind of, maybe it's not the right point. And for most B2B clients, it's like, or B2B markets in general, it's like one to 3% of the market that is, that is at this point of time needs your solution. But the other ones, if you add value consistently, that is powerful. So my question there, my follow-up question would be, how do you do it? What kind of framework do you have in order to, to, to keep hitting those potential clients? Yeah. Um... We are, and you mentioned the pandemic, interestingly, of course, we are, we have shifted, right? The total communication format, which used to be, um, everything which used to be face-to-face -face, uh, with the breakfast or, or even lunches that we organized, we shifted into online for the time being. And um, we run a, a series of webinars and in, in the meantime, on even different topics. So initially, when we came out with the breakfast format, we were always talking about, you know, um, 
basically alternative lending. So what kind of formats are available to customers and borrowers when they need it and they can't get it from their banks. We talked a lot about us, the industry, we brought other platforms, other specialty lenders into the discussion. It was an open format, much appreciated. In the meantime, we, are, we have developed the format. We talk about specific situations that the, the customer is in. So for example, a couple of weeks back, we ran a webinar on succession. Okay, so this is, a, by the way, a topic that a lot of businesses are facing um, in Germany uh, because they go, hand, there's a handover into the next generation. Some of them don't even have a successor uh, already. So it's a big topic. So we were talking about this topic and we were bringing um, competence um, to the table, into the discussions. So really subject matter experts from different angles and really have a bright and, and broad discussion around this topic. And again, we add value um, both to intermediaries, sometimes also end clients um, that are interesting and interested in the topic. So we centered it a little around, you know, potential areas of need or pain points uh, that might exist, um, topics that customers have. Um, and the same with the with now with the venture debt or the growth finance, um, you know, situation is because we clearly see this. I mean, in Germany, we have the situation, I think early stage finance, you know, um, angel stuff is, is available. But when it gets to growth, um, the options become scarce and, and, and much less available. And you can't get it from banks. There's only so many or less um, you know, financing or specialty finance uh, uh, businesses that, it, that can help you to go to the next level. And uh, that's why it's important, you know, to talk about also with, with, with these guys, with VCs or PEs, you know, about their portfolio companies or with the companies directly, you know, where to get to the next stage, how to do it. And, um, and that's basically how we centered it a little bit uh, away from the solution, a little bit more on what is it, a, a typical situation that you as a customer um, face in the life of your business. I love what you're saying. Um, that's exactly uh, what we also tell our clients. It's like everybody is, is really good at this is my case study. This is my product. This is how we can help. But you have to put yourself into your client's shoes and think, what are their problems and how can I help them succeed? And maybe it's not my product in the first place, but you are placing yourself as a trusted advisor. Mm -hmm. And then when at some point they need that kind of solution, you at least also on the list of the two, three, four options that they are thinking about. Yeah, that's right. Um, you, we talked, or you said a little bit, uh, you talked a little bit about testing hypothesis. Um, and this is something that, uh, just a short story, and then, then comes the question. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember a talk of um, an investor from the United States, a growth investor, so they invested pretty late in Twitter. And he showed a graph that was like growing and then accelerating really fast. It was the revenue of Twitter. And the main difference was the amount of tests they did per week. So they, uh, from one test a week, in terms of marketing and sales tests, I mean, they accelerated, I think, to five or even 10 tests a week. And um, by this, they found out what works and then they accelerated. And this free notion that many people have that you have to know what works and what doesn't. Uh, that graph just showed, and that story to me at least, that uh, that's not the, the way to think. And you also said in our pre interview that you're pretty uh, in line with this uh, thinking. So, can you expand a little bit on, on how, how you um, frame an hypothesis and then test it and how much resources basically you put into it or anything else that, else that can help someone? And this situation to to change their thinking towards I I have an hypothesis driven thinking with a with a test that makes sense uh, so that I find out what works and what not. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think uh, th th this this is this has been really fundamental uh, uh, for us. Um, I think, of course, we were at the early days. We were quite. Um, keen and, and adamant on, on the belief that, you know, we, we want to help have a solution, we want to help people and we hopefully there is demand for what we can offer. 
um, and let's, you know, let's do this campaign and, and hopefully there's any kind of response. And with that response, we can generate a little bit of business. And then hopefully next time we, we, we just, instead of um, doing a campaign like this, we go larger and we address more. And then with this, we can do more. And, you know, this is maybe a concept of growing, but of course, what's much, much more important is that you become more intelligent about what you do and what I think we started very quickly was then to really build these hypotheses and say, okay, does it make a difference at what kind of, you know, at what point in, in let's say, timing wise, when I release this campaign, right? Um, and it goes from simple things like the time during the day when you shoot off a message, does the day make a difference? Does the, the, does it make a difference when you send in the morning versus the afternoon? 8 a.m., 8.30, 9, 9.15, 11, lunchtime, those kind of little things, right? Uh, how, how does the response behave uh, to, to these little parameters? But then also, of course, cyclicalities. And they're here predominantly important, again, and that's we you have to understand your customer base. Um, you know, there's cyc lot of, lots of cyc cyclical businesses uh, that have financing demand at certain points during the year. I'm thinking about, you know, the, the, the need for them to stock up, you know, before Easter maybe or Christmas, um, you know, whatever the kind of businesses that typically what are the, the sales and, um, and also the procurement cycles. At what point would they have you know, need to build working capital and then release working capital again. So you build a lot of these hypotheses, you know, constantly and also sub-segmenting and say, when is this person most likely to respond to my message? And you refine this. And of course, and that's, that's I think, where the practice is... Um, is then again more challenging with it with regard to the theory because in the theory you know you have your uh, I used my PhD on the, I did a capital markets uh, study and of course you know you run huge sets of data and you have STSS the st statistics system you know which runs you um, analysis and, and everything is you know significant because you run so much data but here in practice I and I, I assume that for 99% of you guys out there it's the same you always run based on limited information and, and you know everything is not perfect and sometimes you only have a sample of a size of this so you can't make necessarily statistically significant um, uh, statements from your findings however you have the intelligence and the feeling for the market that even when you see some pattern being not statistically significant, that you are still confident that there is something behind it. And then you have to take it to the next point and say, okay, when I assume this is the case, what do I do out of it? Yeah, does it mean I should not be sending um, information to, to, to businesses um, in, you know, about funding opportunities? when they are most likely uh, to have an abundance of cash in their cash account. Typically when the Christmas season, you know, has just, you know, washed them with cash from all their sales uh, and those sorts of things. So lots of things to look at. Um, lots of it, I would say, and this is always difficult with, you know, we have in our company, we have a lot of highly decorated academics as well, I think, which is very important. The quantitative analysis is, uh, I would say, I'm always saying it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, in Germany, in Germany, it's a Königsdisziplin, yeah, the king's discipline, uh, you know, the, the quants, I used to work in an investment bank, the quants were always the kings. Uh, I have a very high respect uh, for quant uh, and, and guys that, that, that know what they're doing. But on the other side, there's also this sort of gauging the market, you know, having the pulse and the feeling and the intuition, you know, and the both need to come together because mm. you're in an imperfect world always. And you need to, to, to sort of combine both and, 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 and try and find the right, um, um, derive the right um, outcome yeah yeah i get what you're saying because i'm originally a mathematician by trade <laughs> so financial mathematician so i know what you mean with um, yeah you have to have the quants in place but on the other hand uh, having a price for the market informing the right hypothesis that's like the entrepreneur or 
the the, the business driver um, had, knowing or, or guessing the market and then testing and um, one, one really important point and that's maybe you know what i thought about when you said you can test everything yeah you can test everything but you don't want to test for a local maximum which means like you can get a little bit better you want to look for the global maximum so to say so the mountain that you can reach and i think what you said helps a lot in um, forming hypothesis by looking at your ideal customer and then saying, okay, uh, what would make sense? What do we think is true? And then testing it. Mm -hmm. And by, by sticking to that, by sticking to your ideal customer and, and their needs and habits, I think then you, you have a high chance to reaching this uh, global maximum of uh, optimal performance of your sales and marketing team. Mm -hmm. um, I could talk for hours about this topic um, and we would have had more questions lined up, but we already reached the end of our uh, conversation, Daniel. So um, I have five rapid fire questions for the end now. Um, ready? Absolutely. Cool. What do you, uh, we already talked a little bit about it, but I ask it anyway, what do you do to keep body and mind fit and sharp? Yeah, as I said earlier, I think there's this combination of both. You think, you know, mental activity for me personally means I need to have, you know, um, um, body activity as well. So it means I try, you know, to practice a lot, go out, um, do sports um, as much as I can and, and, and relax a little bit from, from work. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite business book? Favorite business book? Um, I'm I'm not so much into business books really. I like to read press more than than business books. To be honest with you, I mean I have my old Samuelson, of course, who I studied at uh, University of Mannheim, whom, which I'm very fond of still, and has a lot of learnings in there that are still valid today. But other than that, I like really like Financial Times, for example. I think they like they do very thorough stuff, and uh, as well in Germany, Handelsblatt of Frankfurter. Um, that's my sort of preferred liter literature business-wise. Mm -hmm. And do you follow a business leader? Uh, yeah, well, he has deceased, but Milton Friedman, for example, for me is, uh, is one of my long-term and, and, and favorites. Um, I think there's lots of um, true facts in, 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 his, um, in his analysis. Um, and of course, I mean, um, Warren Buffett is also still one that I like. You know. Yeah, a classic with his letters. <laughs> Um, who should be our next podcast guest and why? Next podcast guest, um, I think um, I, would, I would probably say um, uh, Fabian Kienbaum, um, who I'm also personally um, family-wise related to. Um, he is a, a business owner, a family-run business, um, and um, he obviously looks at uh, consulting, um, but also human resource consulting, executive search. And I think he has many good uh, ways of looking at the new work, the environment, you know, how it's going to be in the future. That's very interesting topics. Cool. And last one, and that's something where you can now directly address our audience. Anything that we can help you with? Well, as I've said, we are Credit Shelf. We are always helpful and hope, hope we can help you when you need funding, uh, when you need to grow your company. Um, and when things are not so right and quick with the banks, please come and approach us directly at creditshelf.com. And where can get, people get directly in touch with you? Just connect me via LinkedIn, Daniel Barch. I put it into the show notes. Thanks a lot for Thank being you. our guest. It was a pleasure. Thank you.